Greetings folks, Daniel Wickwire here and welcome back to Kaiju Movie Review. I am of course joined by my loyal co-host Mr. Zach. I am not here by choice, I am here because of threats against my life. Sub subjugation. <laughs> and I Yes, exactly. I assure you by the time this episode ends, Zach will not lift me above his head and throw me into a palm tree. I will definitely think about it. We got to we got to make it just as look just as good as it might have ha it might have if it happened in the movie we're talking about today. Of course, but today we got to talk about first our news. So go ahead, Mr. Zach. Uh so I wanted to talk a little bit about an upcoming game that is coming out for various VR headsets. And while I personally am not a big fan of virtual reality, I know there are plenty of people out there, and I think this looks just kind of neat. Is a new uh, virtual reality game from a hold on a second. It's a new virtual reality game from a developer called Fight for Dream for the HTC Vive, and it is called Monster Awakens, and it is essentially a VR game where you play through the eyes of a kaiju and run through and destroy a city. Uh, it looks like kind of a neat concept. Uh, you know, they released an initial trailer. Trailer looks kind of neat. Like I said, I'm not a huge proponent of VR, but this is definitely something that I would look at if I did have a VR headset because it just seems like a cool concept and kind of something that makes sense for a VR. You know, because this, this kind of makes sense for a VR experience. You know, you're... you're you go through the eyes of a giant kaiju and destroy a city. I mean, what else What else would you do with VR, right? It's very true. And I wonder if this is the same one I looked up like a long time ago. I can't remember, but it sounds very familiar. It, it, it looks like it, it came out, like I think it initially was uh, introduced a few months ago. Looks like their most recent trailer was from late December, and it is going to be going into Steam Early Access at 10 bucks. so... You know, if you got a if you got a headset and you're a kaiju fan, I mean, it's probably a little worth looking into because it might be just a neat little way to, you know, get some use out of that headset and not, uh, you know, scar yourself for life by playing like Doom or something on it. Well, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> well, from what all my research, it, it's between that for sheer quality. If you have just unlimited amount of money, the HTC Vive is essentially the best VR, consumer grade VR headset you can buy. And the and the, ne the next closest one is the PS4 because you have to have a PS4 to get it, so it ends up being a big investment in the long run, at just about as much as a Vive. But it's you know more entry level if you already have a PS4, I guess. But no, the the Vive's really good. I've watched a lot of people play it. It's really cool technology. It's actually got me interested in VR, and I'm normally not, but uh, it, it looks pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's well, fine. I mean, Dan no, what do, you, what do you have for us this week, Dan? Well, this week I have more toy news because why not? But anyway, there is a special edition Shin Goji figure, his final quote-unquote quote, form or fourth form or yes or no. Magic. Fourth form, yes. It's his fourth form in the film. Sorry, it took me a minute. There is an X Plus slash Premium Bandai Special Edition being released in March 2017. It's the same mold as the Shonen Rick version, which is a kind of an exclusive version of, of X Plus figures that usually have an extra piece or item or different head or something to go with them to make them more unique, more desirable. But this one is all molded in this clear purple, similar to the same color as his radioactive breath in that film, but it's not like a solid figure. Like most X pluses are like a beautiful one giant piece kaiju figure or we'll all put together a kaiju figure. This is actually a kit. So you'd have to put it together yourself. I don't think it'd be a whole lot of pieces because of how these things are built, but you just need to put use your own adhesive. It's going to be like a hundred bucks comes out in March. You'll have to look for it. It's a P Bandai exclusive. If you've me and Zach do a lot of Gundam stuff. So we know about these. It's kind of hard to get them outside of the of the you uh, uh, of Japan without spending a bunch of money, but they are out there. Uh, you know, I actually read recently, not to get off on a tangent, uh, a friend of mine that also builds uh, Gunpla. She actually uh, told me that they recently did a uh, survey where they were basically gauging interest of, on the P Bandai exclusives for uh, U.S. So. 
it is possible we could get these things stateside. Yes, I want a gun diver. I want a gun diver. Give it to me. Oh, yes, that'd I be want, nice. A, I want a lot of P Bandai exclusives. We will see what happens. Of course. But yeah, it, it's something that will be available soon, so just keep your eyes open for that. So today, we will be talking about the 1955, I don't know if I want to say classic, Revenge of the Creature, which is the sequel to The Creature from the Black Lagoon from 1954. And you, the, could, you, could have said, you could have said it's the sequel to the classic Creature from the Black Lagoon. That's true. The Creature from the Black Lagoon is a very good movie, and what's considered the last of the Universal Monsters, uh, the core Universal Monster movies. But it was also the prequel to 1956's The Creature Walks Among Us, which I've never, ever seen, but everybody told me it's garbage and worse than this movie. So we'll I don't get know. to it. Oh, we will. Oh, we will. I, I just hope that it has that iconic uh, that iconic sting that it plays every time you see The Creature. Do, do, do. The first two minutes. Then, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that thing is like iconic. Like I hadn't seen these movies in, in forever, and I, I like when I first saw The Guild Man, I was like, it's coming! Oh yeah, it didn't take long, that's for sure. But the movie was released on May 13th, 1955. The runtime is 82 minutes. It was directed by Jack Arnold, produced by William Alland, written by William Alland and Martin Berkeley. It is starring John Agar, Lori Nelson, and Rico Browning. And I wanted to make mention before I forget later, Rico Browning is the only individual to play the creature more than once, and he played him in all three movies in a very specific role, and we will talk about that later. But he's a really cool guy. We need to talk about him at some point. I also want to point out that although it is an incredibly small role within like the first ten minutes of the movie, uh, this movie was actually the very first on-screen appearance of the... legendary American actor Clint Eastwood. It is very true, and he has a rat in his pocket. And it's, it's, he does. I pointed out to Angela, before the, I knew this before the movie, even like before it even came to that, because I've known about this bit of trivia for a long time. It came up, I was like, hey look, dear, it's Clint Eastwood. My wife just stared for a minute, and they're like, oh my gosh, is it him? I said, yes, this is really his first movie, because he was in this, because he didn't get a part in another movie. He actually didn't get it, because the, the director hated his acting. And he got lucky getting a part in this movie, and then he went on to, of course, do a bunch of other much more impressive things. But he was actually in the film Tarantula, which was released a year later. A year or two. It was 56 or 57. Yeah. But he this, was in I, that, too. I, I believe this was his very first thing, though. Like, this was oh, yeah, before yeah. he even did, like, anything on television yeah. or anything. Yeah, this was his first role. Yes, his first and obviously, film And obviously would go on to be in some very iconic films and characters over the years. And direct some very iconic films as well. Oops. Yeah, exactly. I'm kick, job. I'm kicking stuff over. I'm sorry. Ah, sound pollution but the movie be- Swatch. <laughs> I know right <laughs> I know right there's some things that happen in this movie that we're not going to fully explain we're going to kind of keep everything mostly within the context of this film if you need to go watch the original it's a really really good movie believe me we'll wait we're not going anywhere so if you want to go watch it you go do that if not it's, yes. it's not 100% Go pause pause this podcast, go watch it, and then come back. Oh, I assure you, we'll be here. Uh, but it's it's a really it's a really really good movie. It's it's a classic, and we will talk about this one at some point. But we like to be different. We don't like to do things in order. We like to do in whatever the hell order we feel like. So which is it, which is why we did Godzilla raids again and did not do the first Godzilla. And well, yeah, and then went back and what to do 1980, uh, 1954. The only ones I did in order were uh, Gamera for whatever reason. So that one I felt like doing. Every although, movie. although YouTube felt like pulling one of your game reviews down, so that is no longer the case. Well, I'll get back. It'll it'll be back. It'll make a return. But again, some of the stuff you might be like, well, this doesn't make sense. We'll make some mention of the original film. You don't have to have seen it, but it helps if you want to watch it. The movie starts with two scientists named George and Joe going to the Black Lagoon to capture the Gill Man, which is the name of the monster. For those of you who haven't seen the first film. And it is a monster that was discovered the year prior, alluding to events of the first film. And by the way, everybody has boring names in this American white 50s suburban name. Yeah, right. Everybody. They're, they're like the most generic names. I'm like really surprised there wasn't like a Jack or John or something. I know, or Steve. There's, there's one name that kind of stands out to me, but I'll get to that. 
So with the help of a local captain, the one of, the captain that helped the original crew from the first movie when they discovered the creature, he helped these folks because he knew how to get to the Black Lagoon. With his assistance and the help of some well-placed explosives, they do manage to stun the creature and capture him, load him onto the boat, ship him away. The scientists transport the creature from the Amazon to the Ocean Harbor Oceanarium in Florida for scientific research as well as some kind of tourist attraction and a way to make a quick buck. Upon its arrival, Joe must revive the creature in it's almost like a wading pool by walking him around, around face down. It, it's similar to what they do with sharks when they need to resuscitate them or larger ichthyids. I don't know. Fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. For I, fish. I know yeah. And it, it, they'll walk him around to move water over the gills and, and take CO2 out of the body because he's still stunned from his long-ass boat ride. Yeah, and, and Helen explains it in the movie. Yeah, she does a nice narration. But anyway, Joe kind of walks him around for a bit. The creature eventually snaps out of it, tries to attack Joe. In the skirmish, Joe gets away, climbs up the ladder with the help of two other dudes. These two other dudes just get stuck in the water and get attacked by the gill man. Nobody ever mentions it again. They don't pull. You don't see them pull them out. So as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> yeah. they're dead. Like, like Joe attempts to save one of them, and then they just forget about them after that. They're like, screw them, they're not relevant to the plot, and Joe has plot armor, at least for the time being. The Gill Man, after the Gill Man escape, attempts to escape from his enclosure, he's captured and moved to his permanent enclosure where he's chained to the bottom of a large aquarium where there's many fish and stuff floating around him, and... It's kind of interesting that they're they're talking about having to feed the gill man, but some for some reason, and they kind of go into it a little bit that he won't eat the fish that are in the tank with him, which is kind of weird. But you know, whatever. Well, I, I'm I'm not I'm not a scientist. Well, well, so I, mean, I got to say this real quick. This whole you, you mentioned it being I read in this 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 little bullet points we put so we can help remember everything that happens. I'm reading over this, and you tell me this. You you talk about the the, the Gill Man being chained to the bottom of the of his pool or whatever his enclosure, and I think of oh, like you do with a dog. And then my next thought is that episode of The Simpsons where they move away from Sideshow Bob <laughs> and they yeah. chain the dog in the back and that, that pylon in the water out back. See, see. Now you're going to have to go to FrankieAct.com and actually pull up that clip or grab that screen cap so you can put it on the video. Wait, I will put this on YouTube. I will put it, but I'm going to... You, you can even make a GIF of it and just have it have the picture of Santa's little helper. <laughs> oh, God, that's good. Homer, where's the dog? Oh, I chained him up out back. <laughs> and we, we do that to avoid copyright claims. Exa so. Exactly. Go ahead. But anyway. Anyway. This introduces us to Helen and Ferguson, who are actually our main characters, and despite not being involved in, like, the first 20 minutes of the film, are going to be, you know, the, the leads and the two, then the love interest, because this is a movie from the 1950s, we have to have a love interest, and the thing that really bugs me about this is, like, Helen, at the beginning of the film, comes across as kind of a, you know, strong, independent woman, and, like, as soon as they establish this relationship, like, she just suddenly just turns into this like damsel in distress and like she instantly like forgets everything about science talks about how she doesn't want to you know she doesn't know why she's gonna she's trying to pursue that trying to pursue a career in ichthyology and like the, the just archaic writing practices like this drive me nuts in old movies well it's like it's, i don't i don't know i don't know how you feel about it but i just i just found that kind of thing like they introduce this character they're like here's this female lead she's you know this like no nonsense doctor and this is what's going to make her unique and then like a half an hour later they strip all that away from her well i, I agree and i will say i watching a bunch of these movies i i and i don't advocate advocate the sexist bullcrap by one, any stretch of the imagination but i think it's kind of the charm of these movies because they're kind of like a time capsule a bit of how this this it, it a lot of people seen it back would see it back then and, no, I don't like it. I generally don't. I don't like sexism. That's not how I believe. I think it's a lot of horse shit. People tend to be sexist even if they try not to be. There's always a little bit of it, be it culturally or otherwise. But, no, I mean, that's just how those movies were. And I do hate that they ruined her. Because she did start promising and it just quickly, like, like petered out downhill. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm not, and I'm not sexist either, but I do think, Dan, that your wife should go make us a pie. 
Yes. I was about to say, I was about to say, the whole time I'm looking at this, the whole time I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the scene like Helen's like, I love you. And Ferguson's, I love you too, but your place is the kitchen. And then like, that's how exact, that's the whole, like the whole movie in a nutshell. Exactly. It's such crap. But anyway, so they begin to do intelligence training with the Gill man and they're trying to, you know, teach him, you know, certain things using food they're trying to teach him commands like stop and, and whatnot using uh, like an uh, electric prod basically to show him like what they, if they, they basically prod him when he's doing something they don't want him to do. And they reward him with food when he does something po- you know, it's positive reinforcement. Like you train a it's dog. Like, it, yeah. It's like Pavlov's dog. So over time, you know, the creature becomes a bit fixated on Helen. You'll notice when she goes into the aquarium section to look like where the public would see the guild man. He always swims up to the, the uh, window where she's at and just kind of stares at her and puts his hand up there. And during one of the training session, the guild man, you know, manages to kind of play along with their training and grabs Helen and tries to carry her off. Ferguson's able to fend him off and the two get out of the enclosure. But then the guild man is able to break free of its chain and it ends up killing Joe. And, and before, leaving the aquarium and, and disappearing into the ocean, which leads to this whole thing with the police and everything looking for the gill man. And everybody thinks that the gill man's gone and he's heading back to the Amazon, but little do they know the creature has begun to stalk Helen. And I hate, I hate the creature. Now I have to hate gill man because of what he does to Chris and, and Chris is the dog. And it made me, it made me sad, yeah. but yeah. we won't get into that because if you want to see what happens to Chris, the poor dog, and what happens to Helen, and what happens to the Gill Man, you're just going to have to watch the movie yourself. Again, again, what happens to the Gill Man again? Because that's a, I'm not going to say anything else. It's kind of a spoiler, but I'll say what happens again. Yeah, I, not I, don't go, I don't want to go into the ending, but the ending yeah. just rubbed me the wrong way. I'll say that. It's bullshit. Uh, <laughs> I also, I also want to say, we didn't talk about it, but the beginning of the movie, when they get to the lagoon, and and Joe gets in the big the big diving suit and, and goes into the water the first time. It's completely ridiculous because you see the Gill Man and it totally just looks like he's doing like the royal wave. Oh, is he? I wasn't <laughs> even paying attention. <laughs> like if you look at him at the beginning of the movie, it like looks like he's doing like the Queen's wave like towards the boat. Like and it's just like oh the most God. completely ridiculous thing. <laughs> And I was just laughing. That is hilarious. The whole time I was watching it, I was like, "This is absolutely ridiculous," but I love it. That's funny. No, I didn't even pay. I didn't even pay attention. And like you said, you know, this being the '50s, there's a lot of stereotypes and stuff like that that are that are played on. Like the captain is you know, the the captain that helps with the beginning of the movie is, of course, this is all in South America. He's clearly played by a white dude. But He's very very Latino. Yeah, like very... accented stuff. And you know, Joe makes fun of him for like, "Oh, this is." This is dumb. It's all your imagination. It's just a big fish, blah blah. You know. Yeah, and it being like a silly, uneducated jungle man or boat captain, you know, can have yeah, some, some and, brains on him if they're a different color. Which it's funny because this is like Joe's like, oh, I'm a big tough guy. I know what I'm talking about. You're a stupid old man because you think that there's some monster out there. I thought it was funny how Joe dies though. I was like, yeah, Joe. Like, so I did it again. See, there's the f bomb. I'm sorry, it's f bomb for the episode. I got to stop doing that. But yeah, yeah, you really do because we're gonna lose our we're gonna lose our clean rating on him on on uh, iTunes if you keep this up. But yeah, well, let's let's go on to uh, what's the next thing we talk about? Let's talk about let's talk about special effects or the lack thereof. Because yeah. if you think about it, which I actually respect from this movie, I don't get me wrong. I like Toku. I like the added visual effects and all that fun stuff. There's not really anything aside from the suit. The occasional use of explosives, the him flipping over a car, <laughs> and which was, was awesome, which, which, which it was pointless. It way. was so pointless, but it was great. And he just then, like pushed, he just like pushed up against it, and the car just flipped. It's like over. go car. <laughs> you could tell it's a real car, how but how they shot it, obviously they had something off screen rolling it over or whatever. But you could tell it's a whole car because all the suspension and everything's there. Well, yeah, but, and t- and two, when it hits the ground, it like it like hits the camera rig because yeah. if you watch the camera shakes, yeah, when yeah. The, when the car hits the ground, yeah. But I mean, other than that, that that's really 
And then when he throws the guy to the tree, it's like a little bit of wire work. Yeah. And that's it. Like, there's... Uh, the, and I was, that was that awesome, so though. Bad. It, it was so my, bad. It was my favorite... I love that. It's like my favorite scene from that movie. But no, that that's literally, that's literally it. Sorry, I can't talk. The suit looks good because it's pretty much the same one or slightly modified version of the original suit. I, I don't think it's quite the same because it looked better in the original movie. Maybe it's just how they shot it. It, it, they're, they're good. They, they are good for what kind of movie this was. It was a very quick follow-up. Oh, the original movie was shot in 3D, and this was the first sequel to a 3D movie to be recorded in 3D. That's a really 50, esoteric fact. This yeah, 50, for, 50s 3D, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, all which, black and which white. Which, od oddly, uh, Creature Walks Among Us wasn't in 3D. Nope, nope. Nope, nope, nope. Not all. Not, the, the film wasn't shown exclusively in 3D. It was shown in 2D and 3D. And apparently, there was a 3D version that was shown in California in the early 80s on TV. But it used a more traditional red and blue, or not traditional, but traditional at the time, red and blue 3D. They showed it. Uh, yeah, the uh, anaglyph. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's the one. So that's a little interesting factoid for you. Do you have anything to add about the Gilman suit? I mean, the suit was fine. I don't know. Was it the same suit from the first movie? Because it, I honestly thought it looked a little off compared to the original. Well, that's what I said. I, I'm not 100% positive. It's obviously very similar, but it doesn't look 100% the same. Yeah, and it's, mo it's mostly like the head. Yeah. The head. I, I thought that the head of the suit just looked off when when compared to the, the classic creature from the Black Lagoon. Oh, yeah. Uh, like the 1954 original, like... I almost wonder if they didn't like if the suit didn't get if the original suit like the head got damaged or if they repurposed it or, or something and they had to like make a new one and it just didn't uh, you know turn out because it, I mean like like you were saying with the whole Toku thing like like the stuff looks fine for the time but it, it's just one of those rare things where I mean Japanese cinema was just doing better things. They were, they were, you know, they're more ambitious with their films. They were doing, they they were doing better things with a smaller budget too. And yeah, and you got to think this was before the really big monster boom in the U.S. of like 1957 and 1958, where like an obscene number of science fiction monster movies came out. A ton of them came out. So it was right before that happened, and this will be the same thing as. If you haven't, I, I you should go back and watch it. But the previous episode we did on Godzilla Raids again, this is just a movie, you know, capitalizing on the success of a previous film or a film, a classic film, and then rushing a sequel out. Exactly. And I mean it's I mean it was fine. It was it was a fine movie, but we'll we'll get into that. We're gonna we 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 gotta yeah, one other thing I want to mention that before we wrap. Very true. One more th other thing I want to mention is uh, Rico Browning. He played yes. the, the the Gill Man underwater. He was any of the swimming bits. That was him. Not like sometimes when they're coming out of water on the land. No, but if it's just him swimming, that's him. He was in all three movies. He's the only. He's considered the only surviving actor who played an original Universal monster. Because he is. All the other actors that had played him at one point, the creature, have all passed away. Because anybody who, when the creature was on land, it was all a different actor. But anytime it was swimming for the three movies, it was him every time. And he went on to do a bunch of other stuff. But really, I've heard nothing but good stuff about him. He almost drowned in this movie. Similar to what happened to... Gosh, who was it? I think it was Kimpachiro Satsuma, who played Godzilla from 84 to 94, or 95. I think I believe he almost drowned. I know he died on another occasion, but I'm pretty sure he almost drowned. And then I think Haru may have as well, who played majority of the original Godzilla's appearances. But you know, it goes with suit acting, right? But it, it was exactly. just, just a little interesting bit of trivia. And on this one, if you notice when the Gilman's swimming around, you kind of see bubbles coming out of him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And in, in the original movie, I they, assumed he, I, assu I assumed he was just make he was wearing a like a oxygen tank or something. In the original one, they had a fitting for for him to breathe. And in the second movie, in the first one, they didn't. Anyway, we can go ahead and move on to film availability and pricing. So, what did you manage to find on eBay, Mister Zach? Uh, I'm looking right now. Well, then I will talk. Well, yeah. why why don't you start this time and I'll just okay. I'll I'll start this time while you're you're looking on eBay. We're so unprepared. We're so unorganized. We try to make something I'm, good. I'm but... heinous. I'm heinously unprepared. Hey, don't worry. I will be better prepared in a future episode. But we'll get to that in a future episode. <laughs> exactly, exactly. 
Well, anyway, Creature from the Black Lagoon, or not Creature from the Black Lagoon, we're not talking about that. It's the previous one, the, the, the original film, there's a lot of versions available of. Revenge of the Creature was the only recent version I could find was the Universal Monsters. They did, like, they did sets of it that were all three of the movies. They only released them on DVD here in the United States. There was an original collection, which prices vary pre-owned, but you can still get the other one new for about 20 bucks on Amazon. The newer re-release of, or the newer release of the Legacy Collection. Uh, other than that, uh, there is a German Blu-ray that exists that I saw on Amazon for about twenty-five or thirty bucks if you buy it from an individual. But it does not work with U.S. Blu-ray players. It's in a different region, so that kind of limits your option. B. Yes, it is a separate region, and so the DVDs are still made. And you can buy them. Of course, you could rent them from various other services online. But there's just not a lot of love for that movie. I kind of wish they would have done a Blu-ray release over here since they've already got the German one. All they'd have to do is transfer, use the video transfer they used and just use the English cut. But you still have options to watch it if you want to. So what did you manage to dig up, Zach? It looks like over here on eBay, it is available in a couple different formats. As Dan mentioned, it is available on DVD and it is also available on VHS in the United States. Uh, it looks like the uh, it's part, it was released on DVD as part of the Creature from the Black Lagoon Legacy Collection, uh, which appears to sell for around a nice twenty dollar bill. It looks like there was no single DVD release for Region One. Uh, there is single DVD releases for the PAL region, which on eBay are going to run you about twenty five bucks. The original VHS release. Looks like it'll run you about 3 to $5. And the German Blu-ray, which Dan mentioned before, will run you 25 to 35 on eBay, just kind of depending on your seller and everything. As Dan did mention, though, the movie's not available on Blu-ray in the United States, unfortunately, despite the fact that most of the other Universal Monster films have gotten Blu-ray releases. They also do not have, as I mentioned, a individual DVD release. So really the only way to get this movie is to either stream it through an online viewing service or to buy or to buy the Creature from the Black Lagoon Legacy Collection, which, I mean, primarily, unless you're living in a big city that has more of a specialty store, you're probably really only going to find in stores around Halloween. That's very true. They usually have the Halloween collections at Walmart, Target, stuff like that. But there is another version of the film that I forgot about that you should watch over any other version of the movie. On Amazon for twenty seven ninety seven, you can buy the MST three K collection number twenty five, and that has, of course, Robot Holocaust, Operation Kid Brother, Kitten with a Whip, and our movie of today, Revenge of the Creature, and MST three K's episode or uh, coverage, if you will, of Revenge of the Creature is absolutely hilarious. It is a great episode. If you want any way to watch this movie, I would really recommend that one. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I, I that's actually how I was first introduced to the movie was via Mystery Science Theater 3000, and I thought that they did a fantastic job of, of lampooning the movie. Um, and I, I want to I name drop another movie that we saw on there, and I just cannot think of the name of it for whatever reason. You know, the one damn with the Canada one. Oh, yes. Troy. 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 I, know I know you have the map. Oh, God. Uh, it's Final you, Sacrifice. Final it's Sacrifice. Final Sacrifice. And, and, and you know what? Maybe someday, since 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 the monster from the movie is considered a bit of an iconic monster, maybe someday we can do this island Earth. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, that's true. <laughs> uh, that we can. And at one point, we may we may very well do that. But yes. Uh, anyway, Mystery Science, Th- Mystery Science Theater three thousand is really good, and I'm still waiting for their new stuff coming up. It's still in the works, but they are doing new stuff. But anyway, that's that's not what we're talking about today. What are your closing statements on the film, Mr. Zach? So as I started mentioning in the uh, special effects section, I thought the film was fine. It was harmless. It kind of drags a little bit in the middle. Overall. It's passable. It's not as good as the original Creature for the Black Lagoon by any stretch. But, you know, I enjoyed it for what it was. I think it's a little more entertaining in the MST3K version. But, you know, this this original version is fine as well. That's not a bad movie. I agree. 
I'm a, not that I always agree with Zach because, of course, we tend to have a similar train of thought. It's a fine movie to watch. I, I believe MST3K was my introduction. I've seen it with, with the crew of MST3K. I've seen it without, not just counting today. It's a fine movie. <laughs> it's stereotypical. It goes from... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> bra, bra. Yes, yes. That's what I thought of when I seen that. You have to watch. I did too. That same thing. I was like, oh my god, I saw this on MST3K. <laughs> you just have to watch it. It's it's so good. But it goes from a monster hunt movie to like this, like weird romance. Yeah, thing. monster hunt movie to like a romance out of like that progresses extremely rapidly to uh yeah, to it, essentially. It, oh, good. It's, it's, it, it 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 happens like within like a week. Like, cause oh, yeah. they mentioned when they first meet, like, oh, I'm only going to be here for a week. And, and yeah, it turns, it does. It starts as a monster hunt movie and it turns into like a romance film featuring a monster. And then, and then ultimately like a, 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 a police chase movie or like a, a prison break. Cause he breaks out and they're like hunting him and, it, and literally, yeah, if you it listen turns to it, back into a monster hunt movie. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. If you listen to it, he mentions to the officers that it's her fiance and they've only known each other a week. That happened off screen, by the way. It did. They never mentioned what. Not really much of a spoiler. I mean, it's just it, it's like it progresses quickly and whatever. Anyway, it doesn't make much sense. But it, the, dog, like, the dog, the dog, the dog. Poor, poor Chris. I will be, I will be scarred for life because of what happened to Chris. And who names, who names their dog Chris? That's stupid. It's, it's white <laughs> suburban America from the 1950s. Anyway. Exactly. Well, it's like I said, it's a harmless movie. It's a fun watch. I mean, it's I'd take it or leave it. it. You know, if you want something just to watch to kill some time, turn it on. It's not bad. It's a, it's a good way to kill an hour and a half. It plays out fairly quickly. It it, it progresses. There's a few dead moments when they're doing their whole oh, "I love you" kind of thing, but other than that, it's it's pretty good. There's a, there's there's a decent amount of monster action. You don't have to wait to see the creature since it's a sequel. They've got nothing to build on. It's just like ah, here it is. Yeah, you see him like literally in the first five minutes of the film. Oh yeah, there's no wait whatsoever, and, and it's not like foreshadowing. But no, you just see the creature full on, and then the music. The music they get like they're really hyper. Like it reminds me of like a child screaming at you sometimes because like ah, or really quick. I'm like, wow, what's going on again? Bah, whatever. Anyway, yeah, go check it out. It's all right. All right, Zach, if you want to do your outros, outros, outros. Absolutely. Uh, as always, uh, you can find me at tw- on Twitter at CultureZact. That's culture with a K. And you can find me over at CultureShock.com, where I write video game reviews and other gaming-related articles for the Culture Cade, Culture Socks video game section. In addition to Kaiju Movie Review, I'm also co host of Culture Shock's Running the Rope podcast, our monthly ish WWE podcast. I say monthly ish because it kind of depends on how many pay per views they do each month. Yep. Uh, and we also, uh, I'm also the co host of the Pick Up and Play podcast over at Culture Shock, our video gaming podcast. And I would also like to mention, I'd also like to mention that Kaiju Movie Review, if you are unaware, is now available on iTunes as of the time of this recording. The podcast episodes up to Attack of the Super Monsters are available on iTunes to listen and download so you can take us with you on the go. Yeah, we, we do the we do the video for people who watch on YouTube because that's where I started and that's where I'd like all my main content to originate from. But it's a podcast format, so there's yeah, just... But- yeah, the, the podcasts are uploaded uh, to iTunes. Right now, it's it's a little bit behind. Uh, once we do get it caught up, it'll probably the the podcast version will probably come out about a week after the YouTube version. So yeah, it gives more exclusivity that way. And there's some content you'll only find on YouTube, like Monster Bites. It will be posted nowhere else but here. Yes, and and gifts of Santa's little helper swimming outside of the. Oh god, we gotta find Simpsons that. Boat. No, I, I already know where you can get it at. It's fine. Okay, good deal. Good deal. All right, and as he said, I, aside from this, of course, aside from doing Kaiju Movie Review every two weeks with Mr. Zach and every other week in between doing Monster Bites, I am also a member of CultureShock.com. I'm a multimedia director over there. I stream video games for them normally every Wednesday and Saturday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I'll provide links below for Zach's tw- uh, Twitter, even though he just mentioned it, mine, Culture Shock's website, my Rome 21 plays, my YouTube channel is where I archive my videos. I'll put my Twitch channel down there. 
and all sorts of fun information. Of course, be sure to check us out on Facebook, Kaiju Movie Review. Just search us up on there. We're the only ones, I promise. Follow me or Zach on Twitter. Uh, my wife, I'll put hers on here, Angela. She does a lot of work for us. If you want to follow her on there, she does all the hard stuff. We just talk in front of a microphone. Yeah, Angela's our Angela's our editor. She's our she's our hero, Angela. We we love you. <laughs> Zach says you're his hero. I'm hero. Yeah, because you do all the hard work. Okay. She says okay. <laughs> uh, you ain't gonna like when you watch this video. If you watch, you ain't gonna like what you said earlier. Ha! <laughs> Under the bus. What? No. Yes, yes, it's I in it's in the bad. review. Oh yeah, it's in the review about the pie. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. Uh, Zach, uh, why don't you go ahead and let the folks know what we're going to be watching or recording or listening to us in two weeks. What movie we're going to be doing. So on our next edition of Kaiju Movie Review, we will be looking at Gahara. The long-haired giant monster. The long-haired, was it? The long black-haired giant monster Gahara. And I've never, I have never watched Gahara, so this will be all new to me. It's brilliant. And it, I'm kind of thinking it's going to be short because it's a really short. It's not even really a movie. It is. It's a short film, but it's it's. Oh God, it's so good. It's such and, good. And and as I alluded to earlier in a future episode, we may or may not have something special. Oh yes, happening. But you'll just have to wait and see, won't you? I will say in the very near future we have something very big planned for Kaiju Movie Review. So please stay tuned. Yeah, if you don't watch this regularly, I'd recommend it because it's going to be in the very next next several episodes. But until then, we will catch you guys next time. Mm-hmm.